from the Word of God, the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 14, verses 12 and 16. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciple asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said and they prepared the Passover meal there. In literary terms, a hero is the protagonist of a story who embodies the virtues of the reader's culture. They may be strong, gracious, and morally pure, They are often valiant warriors, heroes are. Sometimes they may be cunning or wisecracking or have other endearing flaws. By its nature, Lent is not something we associate with heroism. Lent is a time of self-denial, of recognizing our moral laws, repenting and recommitting to follow Jesus. So the heroes of Lent do not fit our conventional notions of heroism. At the beginning of every play, we typically find a list of characters in a short description. Romeo, son to Montague. Juliet, daughter to Capulet. Major characters are listed before minor characters. First and second watchman, for example, citizen of Verona. If you are the kind of person who sits through movie credits to the very end, you read the names of actors who have played, for example, Girl on Subway Number One or Sandwich Eating Man, characters who never get named but who either stand in the background or have one or two lines of dialogue. They are the ones who simply point to the sky and say, look, it's a bird, it's a plane. Sometimes they are merely what the movie industry calls extras. Yet without them, the action is flat. They give voice to what the audience sees and wonders. They direct our attention to the action on the stage. Sometimes they deliver news of a key plot point. So who is the guy with the water in the Mark scripture? How does Jesus know to direct his disciples to find him? Is it just divine intuition, perhaps? Something that Jesus knows mysteriously because he is the the son of God? Or is it a prearranged signal, something that Jesus had orchestrated beforehand out of earshot of the disciples, carrying water, some scholars say was typical work reserved for women? Was the man one of the sect of Essene, religious reformers who believed in celibacy, perhaps? Was he a slave? And who is the the owner of the house, you wonder? The owner is clearly a follower of Jesus. Jesus sends a message to him with regal authority, saying, Where is my guest room? Verse 14. My, Jesus says, as though everything the anonymous man owns belongs to Jesus. 
The owner shows the disciples to a large room furnished and ready for the Passover feast. It's fun to speculate and theorize about these two anonymous people and their connection to Jesus. I imagine them as two unnamed disciples, part of the the crowd who heard Jesus teaching and resonated with his descriptions of a coming kingdom, like the unnamed woman who stood at a distance at the cross, or the unnamed woman who washed Jesus' feet. They are the followers who, who stepped up when the inner circle of named disciples fell away. The understudies who were minor characters until the main ones decided not to show up. (laughs) So as the authorities in Jerusalem begin putting up wanted posters around Jerusalem for Jesus of Nazareth, these two individuals realize they have the opportunity to offer Jesus and his followers safe sanctuary within the city. Jesus and his inner circle will be able to celebrate the Passover within Jerusalem, the hope of every observant Jew of their day. Through their arrangements, these two characters provide Jesus with the shelter that enables him to break bread with his disciples right under the noses of the people seeking his death. Perhaps they are also the same ones who allow the disciples to huddle behind their locked doors after Jesus' crucifixion in John 20, 19. This is not the first time that Jesus has apparently arranged things quietly beforehand. In John 11 and 2, before Jesus ever enters Jerusalem, he sends disciples ahead to retrieve a colt so that he may ride into Jerusalem. While it's possible to read these instructions as mystical, divine foreknowledge, I prefer to see it as a hint of Jesus' life outside the view of the narrator. Jesus has a life that extends outside the scope of the text. In John 13 and 27, for example, Jesus tells Judas what you are about to do Do quickly. The other disciples assume that perhaps Judas has private instructions from Jesus to take care of some business, something apparently so in keeping with Jesus' character that they never question until later. I love hearing this side of Jesus because I I like to imagine what his activities might have been outside of the biblical text. He had a real life, you know, with acquaintances like Peter's mother-in-law, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and Mary Magdalene, of whose story we catch only in snippets. I was a part of the generation that grew up with Star Wars I love pretending to be the hero, Luke Skywalker, locked in a battle with the villain, Darth Vader. I love the eye-popping special effects and the amazing diversity of alien life from uncharted worlds. And like others of my generation, when the long-awaited prequel movies came along, I was disappointed and frustrated. Part of the reason for my disappointment was that while the first movies opened up new worlds and allowed space for my imagination to play, the later movies closed those worlds, tied up loose ends, and made the imaginative universe much smaller. Good stories, well told, feel like real life. There always will remain untold stories, loose ends and unfinished business, minor characters who appear on the, on the scene and, and move the action forward. Perhaps they are not heroes. Their role is too small. Their dialogue 
too brief. But you know from the role they play that they may be heroes, perhaps in a different story. This is the way that real heroes operate. An anonymous stranger bangs on the doors during an apartment fire and gets everyone out of the building. A woman pulls a child out of the undertow and the grateful parents realize they never asked her name. The two individuals who stepped forward to offer housing to this would-be Messiah who was constantly on the run, who had nowhere safe to lay his head, who was born in a manger because there was no room elsewhere. These persons risked their own necks to shelter an outlaw. Without them, we might not celebrate the Lord's Supper the same way. Every time we break bread and tell the story, we owe a debt of gratitude to water-carrying man number one and house owner, the minor characters who became heroes.